Thank you, Trio, for that great song. Now then, open your Bible in the book of Revelation to chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia. By the way, for those who don't know, Alleluia. And hallelujah is the same word. I heard a great people saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice 
and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Thus reading through verse 8 of Revelation chapter 19. The amen and the hallelujah. I read about a young fellow who was going to see his girlfriend. And in order to get from where he was to her house, he had to cut across a man's pasture. And in that pasture, he had a very large and mean bull. And as he was telling the story to his friends later, he said, here I was crossing that pasture and suddenly I heard the sound of that bull. And I looked around and there he was, big as a freight train. And he came chasing after me. And I started running as hard as I could, but he was faster than I was. And I knew I couldn't outrun him. And as I ran the hardest I could, the only hope was that there was a tree out there in the middle of that pasture. And I figured that if I could get to that tree and get up the tree, I'd be all right. And as I got closer, I realized that the closest limb to the ground was about 20 feet high. And I thought, I don't know if I can make it or not. But I ran, and just as that bull was about to hook me with his horns, I leaped as high as I could. And the fellow said, did you catch the limb? He said, not on the way up. <laughs> I'd want to say an amen at that point if that had been me or a hallelujah. Now, folks, amen and, the, and hallelujah are two words that are the same in every language in the world. They are defined as, so be it, Lord. Amen, so be it, Lord. In our worship circles, it has taken on additional meaning. And as one fellow said, saying amen to a preacher is like saying sickum to a bulldog. And so it's an encouragement. It's an agreement. It's an, a, a, a coming together of worship when we declare an amen. Secondly, the word hallelujah is defined as praise to Jehovah. So when these are singing their hallelujahs, notice that they said in verse 1, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. There is the word and there is the definition of the word as they declare that he is worthy to receive glory and honor and praise. Now, folks, the amen and the hallelujahs ought to be at home in anybody's and in everybody's church. And before we as Baptists became so formal, we were a praising people. I came up in one of those kind of churches. Be honest with you. Some of you did too. I see you nodding. I came up in that kind of a church. And we had an amen corner. But the only thing about our corner was it was all over the building. And, uh, and when the preacher really got to, as we used to say, shucking the corn, uh, folks would really get in to the meeting and they would echo all about over that meeting, uh, all about over that building. Amen and hallelujah. Wow, what a wonderful thing 
to be in a building where God is so present and his, his, the evidence is so wonderful and you have those chills that run all over your body and you can't hardly stand it until you cry out from down deep in your soul. Amen and hallelujah. But we've gotten beyond that. We have now become, instead of God's chosen people, we've become God's frozen people. Billy Sunday said the average church today is so cold that you can ice skate up and down the aisles. I read and I find that a quarter of all Baptist churches in our country any given year baptize no one. That troubled me. It still does. I wondered why. I think I've now got the answer. Babies aren't born in ice boxes. We put them in incubators to keep them alive and to allow them to grow. But in our church world today, one fellow told me one time that the reason certain people didn't come to our church was that they were afraid that, uh, that we would steal their people away from them. I said, oh, no, no, most of those people would freeze to death in the church where we are. We've gotten so formal and so cold. Vance Havner described it well when he said that the reason many new Christians fall away is that they have to backslide in order to get into fellowship with the rest of the church. Have you noticed that every church seems to have a committee that is common all across the country? They weren't elected. They weren't appointed. They're just there. I call them the cold water committee. They stand at the door of the church and let people know that you won't like it here. Why, our preacher preaches too loud and too long. Our preacher gets excited and sweats and spits. Why, you wouldn't be happy in a place like this. And then they come and join the church anyhow. And somebody shows up and says, now I want you to know that we're glad that you've come, but now we've been here since the day the church started. And we don't let anybody do anything until they've been here for 40 years. Huh? Sound too much like reality? I think so. But they'll throw cold water on anything that God's trying to do. You just let a revival fire begin to flicker and that committee will have a meeting and they'll come to the pastor and say, now pastor, we just got to make sure now that this is not, not wildfire, that this is the real thing. We've got to not allow this to get out of the banks now. Why, first thing you know, somebody will be talking about us downtown. Amen. Amen. Listen, friend, it's time folks start talking about the church and talking about why God's doing something in our midst and God's stirring hearts and souls are being saved. I think I told you the other day, I got one of the greatest paydays the other day I've ever gotten. One of our people reported to me that a fellow who is in his 40s came to our service a couple of three weeks ago. And after the service, he said... Man, I don't know what's going on here. Why, well, all of these people that we used to run and cuss and drink and carry on with, why, well, all of them are in Langston Baptist Church now. I said, glory to God. That's what I once said about this church, that the power of God is surreal that people want to get in on what God is doing. An amen and a hallelujah. Well, one of the problems we don't have more of that is that people have become clock watchers instead of God watchers. The clock struck 12, one fellow said, and the church gave up her dead. <laughs> Another said the service started at 11 o'clock sharp and ended at 12 o'clock dull. I know I'm long, 
winded. <laughs> but I had it brought home to me years ago. It was right after Christmas. And there was a boy in our church when I pastored in another church, and that wasn't here. That wouldn't have happened here. And he got a new watch for Christmas. Well, he wanted me to know that he had a new watch. And so as I started preaching, he lifted up his hand to look at his watch and let me see that he had one. And after I'd preached a while, he said, <laughs> and that didn't bother me bad. But when he took it off and <laughs> checked to see if it was running is when I had a little problem. Started at 11 o'clock sharp. Closes at 12 o'clock dawn. Why do we come to church? By the way, while I'm on time, let me just talk to you a minute. Let's say that next Sunday we invited former President Bill Clinton to be our guest and to speak to our congregation. And God forbid that we would, but let's just, <laughs> let's just say that we did. <laughs> and then he came, and it came 12 o'clock, would you walk out on the president? Oh, no. You respect his office more than that. Hey, if God's here, then why do you want to quit? Why you want to leave? If God's walking the aisles, if the Spirit of God is stirring souls, if the name of Jesus is being exalted, why do people say, I'm giving him two more minutes and if he ain't done by then, I'm going home. Come on. Clock watchers instead of God watchers. I believe it was Miss Lois that shared this with me. I love the story said two women who had been friends all of their life. If you saw one, you saw the other. If one went on a diet, the other one went on a diet. If one of them started on a walking exercise program, the other one did. Whatever one did, the other one did. And after a lifetime, one of them died and went to heaven. And the one left just mourned over her. But several years later, she too died and went to heaven and the first person she saw was her friend that she had spent so much time with and the friend greeted her and said let me show you this wonderful place and she carried her around and showed her the mansions and the streets of gold and the great banks of flowers and the, and the river of water that runs out from beneath the throne and why it was just wonderful beyond imagination and then this last one began to cry and she said, why are you crying in a land like this? Tears are not welcome here. She said, I'm not crying because I'm sad. But she said, I'm crying because if we hadn't been on all of those diets and if we hadn't eaten all those twigs and all those uh, nuts and all those things, I could have been here 10 years before now. That's what's <laughs> wrong with me. So we ought to just let go and let God have his way. Now, there should be an amen and a hallelujah in every church. Now, I want you to help me with this sermon. I'm going to divide the church. Now, I normally never would do that. I believe the church ought to be in unity. Amen? But right now, I'm going to draw a line right down through here. Now, Francesca, you're on that side. And Bill, you're on that side. And running right between you two ladies there, that's where the line goes. Now, the reason I point that out is that everybody on this side, you're on the amen side. Amen. Well, bless God, you're, you're ready to go. And everybody on this side is on the hallelujah side. Hallelujah. There you go. Now, anytime that I lift my hand and say, you say, amen. and anytime I say, you say, hallelujah. all right, let's practice it. You got it down. We're ready to go now. We're ready to preach. So anytime I give you the signal now, you just respond with an amen and a hallelujah. There ought to be an amen 
and a hallelujah from the pulpit. I'm telling you now that any man who is worth his salt and who has felt the call of God, he ought to have something to say from the word of God and from his heart that ought to bring out of the people an expression of, of the power and the wonder and the glory of God. Now, I want you to know, folks, you missed it just then. Amen. All right, we're together. We're going to get it done. And uh, there is an amen. There's an amen to the word of God. My friend, if you go back to the book of Joshua, chapter 8, beginning at verse 30 and read through 35, you'll find that Joshua, when he brings the people into the land, that he is commanded by God to separate them, six tribes on one side of the valley, six tribes on the other side of the valley. I'm just gesturing now. <laughs> Six tribes on one mountain, six tribes on the other mountain, and uh, then they were to build an altar down in the valley. And, and Joshua and the people, the priests, would stand around about that, that altar. On that altar, they wrote the Ten Commandments. And all day long, they began to read the law of Moses and the other uh, laws of the Bible. And every time they did, these were like what we call antiphonal choirs. That is where one sings and the other answers. There you go. And so when they said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen. That crowd said their amen and this crowd answered a hallelujah. Thou shalt not kill. Amen. Thou shalt bear no false witness. Amen. So all through the reading of the law, the people said, that's right, God. We agree with that. And I praise you, Jehovah, because of the word that you have given that will set us free and will keep our society and will regulate us that we might honor you. And then they said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, I was waiting to see if you was going to agree with me there or not. But in our world today, you can't get that much of an amen and a hallelujah on some of these things. Thou shalt not. But I'm telling you now that God's word is still his holy word. And when it's read and when it's preached, there ought to be an amen and a hallelujah. You remember, do you, some of you were here then when we read the Bible through in three days. We started on a Thursday and we read continuously through Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And we ended up on Sunday morning during Sunday school. You read the word of God. When you moved out of that into worship, I had people in a Sunday school class and they were reading the word of God. And we did all the opening exercises. And then instead of preaching, we by this time had come to the book of Revelation and we were just reading the word of God. Wow, I wish you could have heard it. All of that building filled and the voices of those people like the sound of many waters as we read together about that land called glory where we see the people rejoicing. There it made national news and uh, we had a reporter from UPI that came and he sat right on the front row, had a tape recorder slung around his neck and hanging by his side to record what was going on. And I watched him as we read. And as I read, the people read. And as we were reading about the holy city of God coming down from glory, I watched that man begin to weep. He had on a blue shirt. And as he stood there and wept, before long, the whole front of his shirt was wet with the tears that he had uh, cried before God. And when the invitation was given, he came to me and he said, Preacher, I was brought up in church. I got away from church. I got away from God. But what I heard here today carried me back to my boyhood. And today I'm coming and I make a commitment afresh and anew to God. Amen. I'm telling you, there ought to be an amen and a hallelujah from every pulpit for the word of God and for the message to hurting hearts. Did you know 
that the Bible is the only thing that can give the people in our world hope when there is no hope? Do you know that folks all around us are hurting? You don't have to go searching for them. Dr. Stewart, a pastor of another day, he said in one of his sermons, he said the man who will preach to hurting hearts will never lack for a congregation. And I'm telling you that as we look around us, you don't have to look hard until you find somebody that's worse off than you are. Somebody who whose heart is broken, somebody whose home is being wrecked, somebody whose life is going into the tubes. And everywhere you look, you find people that are crying out. But then the man of God stands and he says that those who come to Jesus, he, they find repose. Those who, come, those who come to him, they find the answers for life. Those who lean on the everlasting arms will find that God's promises never fail. And it's an amen for those that hurt. And it's a help for those who are suffering. And there ought to be an amen for that kind of preaching. And it ought to be at home in every church. By the way, there ought to be an amen for offerings raised. Listen, folks, listen to me now. Giving is one of the greatest acts of worship there is known to God. And when we give, we are honoring him because of his blessings given into our life. And I'm telling you, you just can't get enough of that. It's such a joy and it's such a wonder and it's such a blessing to know that God would allow me to be a part of the work of his kingdom and that by my giving I'm able to invest in the lives of people around the world and because of our giving we're able to rescue souls that are falling into hell and it's because of our giving that uh, angels rejoice over every soul that comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We ought to be excited. The, by the way, you know God says that uh, he loves a what kind of giver? A cheerful giver. Have you ever had anybody when the offering plate came by that they just sat there for a minute and then they said, glory to God, here comes that offering plate. I can't wait till it gets here. I want to put my money in the offering plate. I ain't ever seen that happen. If I did, it'd scare me to death, I guess. But I believe God would be honored at something like that. One fellow said not long ago was visiting our church, he said, man, they don't take up offering over there in, in pans. They got buckets that they take it up in. I said, that's because I serve a big God and I'm expecting a big offering. Amen? Some of you will remember that day we were having the chest of Joash offering and the building was filled. We needed to raise a tremendous amount of money and some had looked at me and told me I'd lost my mind. There wasn't any way we was ever gonna raise that kind of an offering. But I'd, I'd told you for weeks what we were gonna do and we had that big old chest down at the front and, and I'd instructed you that you are to bring your gifts and you are to bring your pledges and we are gonna put them in that, that chest of Joash to show our love for God and the work that he would have us to do. Well, that morning arrived and the building again was packed with the people. And I began to explain what we were gonna do. And I said, now we're gonna take up our regular offering and the ushers are gonna pass among us and they're gonna come back and when they're through, then we're gonna have the chest of Joash offering. Now that's easy to understand, is it not? Well, the ushers got started and the choir is singing. I mean, everything's going along good. I'm sitting in my chair praying and, uh, I, and then I heard something. The choir about messed up. Some of them, I, start, I could hear them snubbing while they're trying to sing. And I looked up. And by the way, don't ever expect things to get out of whack unless a staff person does it. And so I, I, instead of waiting, one of the staff men said, I got to get my offering in there first. And so while the ushers are still going down the aisle, he brings his offering up to put it in the chest of Joash. Well, when he did, a little boy over on this side said, if they're doing it now, I'm gonna go too. And he cut in a run and he came down and put his offering in. Well, when that happened, people started coming from everywhere. The ushers are jostling around in the aisle. They're being overrun by people trying to get down and put their offering in. And the choir's just tearing up. I mean, they're just, they're just messed up. And I look and here comes a little girl down the aisle. 
Her mascara gave up about the third pew from the back. Little black rivers running down her face. And I walked over to her and she said, Preacher, I can't wait. Can I get saved and get in the church now? Well, what do you think? We just, down on the altar we went. And I heard commotion. Well, I was praying. I didn't need to look up and look around. And I, I found out later that people in the choir started crawling over the rail. Boy, that'd be a jump for them now. But they were crawling over the rail. People were coming from everywhere. We did, I didn't preach. 13 people got saved that day. I told some of the folks, I said, I ain't ever gonna preach again. We're just going to take up an offering every Sunday and see what God will do. There ought to be a, to that kind of experience and there ought to be a, every time the offering plate comes by, somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus, that I can give and be a part of the kingdom of God. Well, you got left out. All right, just don't want to leave, make you think you're not important. There ought to be a, a, pra a, a praise, an amen over every offering that's raised and over prayers that are prayed. Over the prayers that are prayed. Now I confess to you what we did at the beginning of this service, I did not do early in my church life. I, that was for Pentecostals. That was for holy rollers. That was for people who ran the aisles and jumped pews and that kind of thing. Baptist didn't do that. We interpreted James chapter five to mean if you're sick, call the elders of the church to pray and call the doctor. One morning, I was preparing for baptismal, standing in the hallway in my white robe and in my waiters waiting to go into the pool when a lady stuck a note in my hand. Well, I would have read it anyhow. Beautiful lady, blonde hair, and she just passed right on by. She was not a member of our church. She had been visiting for a while, but I didn't really know her. But I, I opened the, the paper and I started reading. Here's what it said. She said, I only have one kidney. It's about the size of a walnut. The doctor says that I'm going to have to go on dialysis tomorrow. I want to know if you will anoint me and pray for God to heal my body. My daughter-in-law was passing by. I said, will you go to the house? I think in the cabinet there's a bottle of olive oil. If there isn't in the garage, there's some WD-40. <laughs> or you bring me a can of motor oil. We're going to anoint this woman. Amen. But then I'm faced with, how do you anoint? Do you know? I've seen folks get a little dab on their finger and press it right twixt the eyes. Have you you've seen that? I didn't know how to anoint. I remember what the scripture says when, when Samuel anointed uh, David. He had a whole horn full of oil, about a quart. And he poured it on his head and it ran down his hair and into his beard and down onto his clothes. Can you imagine one of you women? You got on your new $500 outfit and $150 hairdo and you show up and say, Preacher, will you anoint me? Bring me that motor oil over here. <laughs> and we, How do you anoint? I don't know. And I didn't know that morning, but I got that olive oil and I put some in my hand and I sloshed it around and I laid my hands on her head and our deacons and some of the women came and we gathered around that woman and I pray that God would touch her body and he would cause that kidney to respond and to operate like he intended it for, to do when he put it inside of the human form and that she wouldn't have to go on dialysis. She called me on Monday. She said, Preacher, I want to thank you for anointing me and praying for me. And uh, the doctor examined me and he said, Well, maybe we can wait another week before we do this. The next week she went back and he said, well, things seem to be 
doing all right. We're not going to start dialysis till we have to. Two months later, she came back. She said, preacher, the doctor says that he don't understand what's going on, but my kidney is growing. It's not as small like it was. She's still not on dialysis. After all these many years, was featured not too long ago on the 700 Club as a genuine certified miracle from God. And I want you to know that there ought to be a... And a... For every prayer that's lifted to the throne of God and heaven comes down and glory fills our souls. And folks, I want to tell you what, if you ever get a touch from God like that, nobody will ever have to tell you to say amen. I promise you, when you get plugged in and the light starts glowing in your life, you'll rejoice in the Lord and you'll shout when God touches you in your heart. That's point one. I got 13 more. <laughs> Beg him now. There's the amen and the hallelujah from the pulpit. But there ought to be an amen and hallelujah from the pew. These ought to be at home in every church. For it says, I'm in agreement with what the messenger of God says. I'm in agreement with what the message it says. It's either amen or oh me. That's it. It's one or the other. Hallelujah for amazing grace for souls that are saved and amaze, a hallelujah for amazing grace from hearts that are kept and filled. But in many churches, it's not that way. When I was a student at North Greenville College, we had moved from our home in Lawrence back to the upstate and joined a church there. And so my wife could not go with me that day. And so I went by myself. And as I sat down in that big old church, uh, the pastor was the man who had married me and my wife uh, earlier in our days. And so I was sitting there right down about the fourth pew from the front. And as I sat there, he got up and, and he didn't have much hair. Now this is no reflection on you guys who do not, but he didn't have much hair. And, but, and he wouldn't use a handkerchief. But I can see him, he had wiped his hand and, and, and he would, <laughs> as he kept the, the sweat off of his head. And as he was preaching that day, he said something good about Jesus. I said, amen. And 300 people got whiplash. <laughs> Wanting to see who that is that's talking out during the preacher's sermon. Well, I felt conspicuous, but after all, I was in God's house. Little while he wiped sweat again, and he said something good, and I said, amen. And again, the service just sort of came to a halt. But before the service was over, there's a little old lady sitting in front of me and she had got in on the fire and the preacher said something good and I heard her say, amen, preacher, amen. I said, glory, I, I'm where God is working now in the midst of the people. Ought to be an amen and a hallelujah from the pew. Amen? Get excited over God. I think I shared it with you, but it's worth me telling you again. I believe in baptizing people when they get saved. And God sent me to pastor First Baptist Church of Warren, and I didn't know it when I went, but I'd find it out soon. After I became pastor, they had only baptized five people in 15 years, and they had not baptized anyone in five years. Well, if you cut me, I believe evangelism. And I believe in winning people to the Lord. And soon people were getting saved. I mean, they were just coming from everywhere. One dear old lady in our church, little short, uh, white-haired woman, hair real curly, and her hands all gnarled up with, with arthritis. After one morning service, she stuck that hand out to me, and as I shook it, she said, Preacher, there must be a sinner behind every bush around here. I said, yes, ma'am, and we're shaking the bushes, amen? We're gonna find where they are. And so we were having a baptismal service. Now in that church, it's not like our beautiful building with a baptistry up on high. They built it during the war and they had to scrimp on materials. And so the baptismal pool was down on the floor, on the, on the side of the, of the wall. 
And so here I am in the pulpit, and over there is the bapt I mean, just like an old tub. Well, after all, it is a tub, I reckon. And so the way you got into that was that you came up some steps from behind and you opened the door and you came down some steps into the pool. And the way I had to baptize, I baptized to my left side. Well, that's my weaker arm. Now, I can crush rocks with this one, but now this one here. <laughs> So I was baptizing Sunday night. The lights are down low. The organist is playing real soft music. You get the picture. And here I was. I would baptized this little boy and he went out. I baptized this man. He went out and I would baptized one or two others. And we had been in revival, had a lot of people saved. And uh, that night, the lady came in who was rather large. Now, I'm going to tell you how much she weighed, but she was, she had been right weight if she had been nine feet tall. And, uh, but she came into the pool, and here I am with this lady, and I'm thinking, oh, dear God, my left hand, and I've got to put her under and bring her up, and uh, don't know if I can handle that, but everything's going good. I start down and bring her under the water, and I start to bring her up, and what no one had told her is, don't ever wear a wig when you go to be baptized. She had on a wig. And as her head cleared water, that water sucked that hair. And she grabbed for her hair. Well, when it did, all of her weight went back on that, that weaker arm. And here I am with her. And we, it, 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 I'm at water. The sides of that old tub was saying, woo, woo. <laughs> and little waves going up over the glass and out into the congregation looked like Tarzan wrestling an alligator in that pool well when I finally got her up and restored some order she went out little old boy sitting on the front pew clapped his hands and said do it again preacher do it again I thought oh dear God <laughs> but there ought to be an amen, amen and a hallelujah every time somebody is baptized the Bible says that angels rejoice over everyone that comes home and we ought to get excited and shout the victory ourselves there ought to be an amen and a hallelujah not only from the pulpit and the pew but from paradise you see heaven rejoices over souls that are saved now, if I understand my book, and I believe I do, God says that those of us who pray and those prayers are yet unanswered. And by the way, God does not answer every prayer instantaneously. There are some that uh, go on for years and years. And God teaches us in the Old Testament that he puts our prayers into bottles. Now, I don't understand all of that, but in my own mind's eye, I can see over yonder in glory. And there are great long shelves all around the prayer room there in glory. And there are beautiful bottles. And there are some big bottles and some small bottles. But they contain the perfume. The Bible says that our prayers go up to God as a sweet-smelling savor, as a perfume. And so as these are caught up to heaven, God takes those and he puts those perfumed prayers into a bottle there on the shelf. Well, mama's already been in glory for a long time. Way back down on earth, that boy that she had loved and prayed for and wept over Finally, one day, he comes under the sound of the preaching of the gospel and he turns his heart toward heaven and calls out, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner, and save me for Jesus' sake. And when that happens, I can see that mighty angel go over there, run down the road, find the bottle of prayers from that mama for her boy and bring it back and open it up and pour it out on the golden altar over in glory and the perfume of those answered prayers go all over heaven and our angels begin to rejoice and praise God and somebody says, what's the shouting about? 
And another said, ask her. And there's that mama whose boy has been saved and her prayers have been answered. She's just having a fit. I mean, she's having a Pentecostal fit. She's just glorifying God and running around all over heaven and saying, my boy has come home. My boy has come home. God's answered my prayers. Hallelujah! My boy has come home. God answers prayers and we ought to shout over everyone that gets saved because angels get excited and the heavens rejoice over the crucified lamb and the exalted lamb of God and heaven rejoices over the worship before the throne. If you read it there, you'll see that the angels say, hallelujah, and the elders shout, amen. Because in heaven, folks, nobody gets left out in the praise. You're the angels tonight, and you say, Amen. and you're the saints who echo, Amen. hallelujah, and amen. I used to sing a song, and the words say, holy, holy, is what the angels sing, and I expect to help them make the courts of heaven ring, but when I sing redemption story, they will fold their wings for angels never knew the joy that my salvation brings. You see, an angel cannot get in on the praise that the saints have. They have their own rejoicing, but the saints of God shout and give praise to the Lamb who was, who was crucified for you and for me. Oh, there's more, but I'll stop but hallelujah for what God has given to his people. And in this church, may it always be said that in our services, there's always a place for, hallelujah. and there's always a place amen. for an amen. In everything that we do, let him, our Lord, be exalted. And we bow our heads as we close our service.